In church family, here we are on week number three of uh, COVID-19 lockdown. Week number three, hard to believe, almost a month now, we have uh, not been able to meet together publicly as a church family and worship God together in song, uh, in the teaching of the word, etc. But I got, I came up here the other day to do some things and I got uh, four of the nicest notes I've gotten in a long time just wonderfully encouraging notes um, about the situation. And one of them said, we're all here in spirit. It's a full house today. Smile and teach us. So here's your smile. uh, And here we go. We're uh, still in Exodus chapter 21, in in Exodus 21, 22, and 23, a section in the Bible that's known as the Book of the Covenant, the Book of the Covenant. Uh, We're going to continue today. We're going to cover Exodus 22 and Exodus chapter 23. We're only going to hit high points. Uh, Like I told you last week, we are not Israel. We are the church. We have a specific set of instructions, actually over a thousand, over a thousand commands in the New Testament for the church age believer. The 613 commands of the Old Testament Mosaic law are not for us. They're not directly for us to to obey, to learn and obey. But we do this because it's a part of the Word of God. We know that all Scripture is God-breathed and all Scripture is profitable. And we're moving through the Old Testament chapter by chapter and book by book and verse by verse. So we're going to hit... High points of 22 and 23 to get a flavor of the uh, Book of the Covenant. And then next week we're going to be in Exodus chapter 24. And next week being Easter. Uh, I got another note from, um, from Don Smith this week, a text that said, The churches may be empty for Easter, but that's okay because so is the tomb. And I liked that. The churches will be empty for Easter, for, for um, Resurrection Sunday, unbelievably. Can you imagine that? Empty churches for Resurrection Sunday. Okay, we're in Exodus 21, 22, and 23. Let's open in a word of silent prayer, giving everybody, myself included, the opportunity to make sure that we're in fellowship with the Father and with the Son, that we have no sins in our life that we simply haven't confessed to the Father. The Bible says if we confess our sins, those sins that we know we've committed against God because we've learned the Bible and we know certain things are sinful, if we confess our sins to God, then He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So we take God at His word that we acknowledge our sins and we repeat them to Him. We fess up that His standard was violated by us. And because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross, we're forgiven instantly. And we're back in what the Bible in 1 John calls a sphere of fellowship with the Father and the Son. So let's take a moment in silent prayer and then I'll open us in prayer. Father, thank you again for allowing us to to open your word. Thank you for this church building. Thank you that you've preserved this space for us to come and record these lessons. Uh, Even if we can't meet publicly because of a a public outcry and a fear about a virus. We thank you that the church is not this building. The uh, The church consists of each one of us, regardless of where we are. Each one of us that's placed our faith alone No works, but our faith alone in Jesus Christ alone. Thank you that we are the church. We are the called ones, the saints, those set apart for your service. Thank you, Father, for this morning. Thank you for uh, the book of the covenant. Thank you for these laws to Israel that we can can find and see your character, uh, your character as we look at the book, uh, as we'll speak about here in just a minute. We love you, Lord. We thank you. Again, we thank you for this 
facility and for the ability to do this. Thank you for the technology you've allowed to come, uh, come as far as it has so that we can uh, record these lessons to be seen on YouTube and other places, DVD, etc. We live in quite the time uh, for good reasons and also for bad reasons. We live in quite the time. Uh, I'd like to kick that man, Lord, that said, may you live in interesting times. But we love you, Lord. We serve you and we uh, lift up this time to you in Jesus' name. Amen. I think it was a Chinese man. Some, It wasn't Confucius, but one of those types that said, may you live in interesting times. Uh, and like I said in an email earlier this week, none of us want to be living. None of us would choose to be living in the times we're living in right now. Uh, but yet we are, and God knows that, and we're children of God through faith in Christ Jesus. Uh, the biggest problem we've ever had was taken care of on the cross of Jesus Christ. We've got nothing to fear, nothing to panic, nothing to worry about. Uh, God has us securely in the palm of His hand. This section of the Mosaic Law is known as the Book of the Covenant. It starts, as we saw last time, it actually starts technically in uh, Exodus chapter 20, verse 22, and it ends... At, in Exodus chapter 23, verse 33, which is the end of the, of the uh, chapter 33 or 23. So uh, it's a three chapter long book. We know it's called the book of the covenant because when we get to chapter 24, Moses actually says that when he read the book of the covenant and all their hearing, etc., etc. So we know when the book of the covenant starts where it ends, and we know what God titled it. He titled it the Book of the Covenant and told Moses, use these words. Uh, we said last time, just in passing, that the Ten Commandments were given in Exodus chapter 20, and now the Book of the Covenant, 42 judgments. The Book of the Covenant has 42 judgments, and it's a greater detail about the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments are high and lofty. They're, they're platitudes. And if you have the Ten Commandments on the top, uh, underneath somewhere, under each of these ten lies the 42 judgments or rights in the Book of the Covenant. They fall under, every one of these 42 fall under one of the overarching Ten Commandments above them. In Exodus chapter 22, what we're going to see today, the judgments include these things just quickly. Uh, they include how to handle thieves, people that steal things from you, how to protect each other's crops from theft, how to protect your neighbor's crop from you yourself stealing it. Very interesting. Laws about personal property in this section, laws about sexual seduction. That's almost unbelievable, but it's here. Uh, certain offenses, we'll read about certain offenses that require death. One of them is sorcery. One of them is sex with an animal. Almost unbelievable, friends, but it's here. Sacrificing to a false god. Uh, we're also going to look at, at Exodus 22 at laws which protect the needy and the vulnerable, the foreigners, the widows, the, the, uh, the orphans and the poor. And there's also a section at the end about how to properly respect God. We move into Exodus chapter 23. It's going to continue with laws about uh, not being a false prophet, uh, false prophet, etc. Not being, uh, excuse me, a false witness. Laws against not being a false witness. Further laws about the Sabbath day, the fourth or the fifth. Was it the fourth or the fifth? It's the fourth commandment, the laws concerning the Sabbath. There's more information about that here. Uh, and then it outlines three festivals or feast days that Israel must celebrate to God. We'll cover those very, very briefly very briefly, and it ends the same way the Book of the Covenant started. It ends with the prohibition against idolatry and a, a command to worship God properly. A prohibition against idolatry and a command to worship God properly. Uh, I agree with you. Some of you might think that this is a tedious part of the Bible. I agree. Uh, but only humanly, not, not spiritually. It can seem like a tedious section in the Bible, but I want, you to consider, I want you to consider that if God were a man, whenever you read these laws, whenever you say, uh, that's impossible to keep, or I could never do that, 
Understand this, if nothing else, that if God were a man, this is exactly how he would live his life on earth. What he is commanding of Israel here aren't just some random laws that he's thought up. It's these laws are actually revealing to us and to Israel who God is, what his character is like, uh, what his standards are, etc. If God, my statement is this, if God were a man, not God, but a man, these laws are exactly the way he would live his life. I, I hope things are starting to click in your head a little bit when I make that statement. I'll tie that bow in just a minute. If God were a man, this is the way he'd live his life. His character is being revealed through the law of Moses, through the book of the covenant, etc. Uh, God wants what's best for Israel. There's no question about that. And obeying these laws that God is setting down will cause Israel, God's people, to reflect God's holiness before the whole earth. God is revealing what His character and His holiness look like, and He's saying, people, go be a nation of priests. Do these things, Israel, and reflect my character in the entire world before all of mankind. Look at Leviticus 19, 1 through 4 with me quickly. Concerning God's character, concerning man acting like God. I've made the statement, and I believe it fully, that the law, if God were a man, this is the way he would run his life. This is what perfect man would look like. A perfect man would keep the law perfectly. In Leviticus 19.1, it says, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to all the congregation of the sons of Israel. Now, now look at that. Speak to all of them, not some of them. Everyone in Israel, old, young, male, female, everyone I expect to keep these laws. Speak to all the congregation of the sons of Israel and say to them, You shall be holy. You shall live a distinct, a set apart, a unique life. And then he uses himself as the example. For I, the Lord your God, am holy. See, God says, You be like me. In the New Testament, it says God's desire is that we would become, that we would be conformed to the image and the likeness of His Son, that we would become Christ-like. In the Old Testament, God says, you be holy because I'm holy. You be holy because I'm holy. Be like me. Emulate me. Copy the behavior and the standards by which I would live if I were there. In the Old Testament, 613 commands. Copy the behavior and live by the standard that I would live by if I were there with you. Verse 3 says, Every one of you shall reverence, still on the board here, every one of you shall reverence his mother and his father. If God were a man, he would reverence his mother and his father. I hope you're thinking about Jesus Christ right now. I hope I don't have to say this so directly. I hope you're thinking about the God, the second person of the Godhead who became a man in the person of Jesus Christ. And I hope you're thinking about the Gospels and the information we have about how Jesus lived the Old Testament Mosaic law. Jesus completed the law. He completely and, uh, and fully obeyed the law. Every one of you shall reverence his mother and his father as Jesus did. You shall keep my Sabbaths as Jesus did, for I am the Lord your God. Verse 4 says, Do not turn to idols like Jesus didn't turn to idols. Or make for yourselves molten gods. I am the Lord your God. The point is, worship God only. Be like me. Be like me. Again, God as a man. God, as a man, would reverence his father and his mother. He would keep the Sabbath day. He would never turn the to idols. And God is saying, be like me. Be holy. I've set these standards before you. I call them commandments, uh, ordinances, statutes, laws, etc. There's 613 of them. If you keep these laws, you will emulate my character and my behavior on earth. You'll show people who I am. What else does he say in Leviticus chapter 19? A great chapter, by the way. If you haven't read it, go read it. Uh, a fantastic, 
fantastic chapter about how to live a holy life. Leviticus 19.18 says, You shall not take vengeance, nor bear any grudge against the sons of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. So he says, Be holy, for I am holy. And then the next thing he says in Leviticus 19, 18 is love your neighbor as yourself. So be like me, love only me, don't turn to idols, worship only God. And in your love and your worship of God, the second thing you shall do here is love your neighbor as yourself. And I hope things are going off in your head because we do know that the second person of the Godhead, Jesus Christ, God himself became a man And we have Jesus' words, the God-man, who said this. In response to this question, Jesus is being asked a question. And the question is, Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? Here we are in the Mosaic Law, Exodus 20, uh, on down. Uh, Many, many chapters later, we have the 613 laws play out. And someone comes to Jesus and says concerning the law that's given in the Old Testament of Moses. Can you summarize it for us? Which is the greatest commandment? Of 613, he had quite the choice. But the interesting thing is that he took no time at all. He answered instantly when he was asked. And he said to him, the one who asked the question, Here's the greatest commandment with no equivocation, without compromise, without doubt. This is the top of the list. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. We get that from Deuteronomy chapter chapter 6, verse 4. The great Shema to Israel. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, etc. So that command comes in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commands, so Jesus says, as we're reading the Ten Commandments and the Book of the Covenant, I want you to look for these two things. Jesus says the most important thing you can do as a human is to love the Lord your God with everything you've got. And the second thing is, is like the first, love your neighbor with everything you've got. Love your neighbor just as you love yourself. And Jesus also makes the statements, on these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. The rest of the Old Testament develops and highlights these two laws over and over and over and over. Love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as yourself. And when you read these laws, you could say, If I don't do this law, if you were Israel, remember, we're the church, not Israel. We're the church, not Israel. But if you were Israel and you disobeyed one of these laws, you would either be not loving the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your strength, your soul, or you would be not loving your neighbor as yourself. All the 613 laws fall underneath these two categories, even above the Ten Commandments, these two laws, Jesus says, are the greatest. Interesting to me that neither one of these laws are in the Ten Commandments. One of them is in Deuteronomy 6 and one of them is in Leviticus 19. And these are the ones Jesus calls the greatest. Love and love both times. Love for God, active love for God, and active love for your neighbors. Uh, You can ask yourself these two questions on really any page of the Old Testament. You can ask yourself these two questions. Why are things going so well for Israel right now? Or why are things going so poorly for Israel right now? On any page of the Old Testament narrative, you can ask yourself that question, read it, and think, man, why are things so bad for Israel in this book, in this chapter? Or... Why are things so good for Israel? And the answer will always be understood by these two things that Jesus brings out. Israel is either in the midst of loving the Lord their God with all their heart. I'll tell you, Israel, like I've said a thousand times, 
is either on, is either riding a wave of great great worship, or they're down in a trough of just abysmal lack of worship and idolatry. It's feast or famine with the people Israel. So on any page in this Old Testament, when you're speaking of Israel, you can ask the questions, why is it so good or why is it so bad? And you can always go back to these two questions. Are they loving the Lord or are they in idolatry? And the other question is, how are they treating each other? Uh, is their tribal, remember there are 12 tribes of Israel, are, is there tribal unity and tribal peace or are they warring against each other? Uh, if you don't know the rest of the Old Testament narrative, Israel goes to war several times against themselves. War, I'm talking about warfare, where brothers killing brother, civil war-like things. Uh, Israel was guilty of it on, uh, on more than one occasion. So are they loving their neighbor as they should? Are they loving the Lord their God and not turning to idolatry? And those answers are going to answer what's going on. Uh, with Israel right there on any page for balance because the things I've spoken of so far are Israeli they're Jewish please don't forget I'll say it again the Old Testament the commandments the Ten Commandments the book of the covenant everything we're going to look at today is for Israel not for the church not for the church but for balance I want to show you 1 Peter 1, 14 through 16. 1 Peter, New Testament, church age truth. This is how we should live. Are we under such a strict guideline and a strict set of standards as Israel was? God says, I'm holy, so you be holy. Be like me. Are we under that strict of a guideline or has God lessened the standard for the church age. And we read in 1 Peter 1, a book written to Jews, a book written to Jews that would know the Old Testament, know the commandments, etc. Peter says, As obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lusts which were yours in your ignorance. Don't be like you were as an unbeliever. Don't chase the same lustful things you did as an unbeliever. You're not that anymore. Live like a, a holy one. Uh, live like a set-apart one. And here he says it, But like the Holy One God, like the Holy One who called you, in the same way that God is holy, be holy yourselves in all your behavior. Not just some of your behavior, not just when you're at church, not just when you're at work, not in, in all of your behavior, in everything you choose to do, in every word you choose to utter, in every night you live, in every morning you live, and every afternoon you live, everything you do, Peter says, just as God is holy, be holy yourselves also in all your behavior, because it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. So in the New Testament also, we have the exact same standard laid out for us. God is perfectly holy. He's unique. He's entirely set apart from man. And what God wants from us is to be entirely unique and set apart from unbelieving men that we live around. Can you be spotted as the Christian in the room? You shall be holy for I am holy. So the standards don't change. As a matter of fact, God only has one standard. The heavenly standard will always be the standard. God never raises the bar or lowers the bar for any different dispensation. There's always one standard, and the standard is God Himself. You be like me. I'm holy, so you be holy. So as we see some highlights from chapter 22 and 23 today, I want you to focus on these two things. These two laws. Jesus summed up the law in this way. Number one, love God fully. I want you to look for this. How is the person that does this law or this judgment, how is the person that obeys this loving God fully or loving his neighbor fully? And if you disobey it, how would that be not loving God fully or not loving your neighbor fully? 
And number two, love your neighbor honestly and respectfully, just as you love yourself as an image bearer of God. We're going to fly through some of these things in this book. I just want you to have these thoughts in mind. Love the Lord your God fully and love your neighbor honestly and respectfully, just as you love yourself as an image bearer of God. So in uh, Exodus chapter 22, verse 1, we see uh, an explanation, a greater explanation, just a couple of examples of the Eighth Commandment. The Eighth Commandment was, you shall not steal. Remember, commandment number eight, you shall not steal. And so here in 22.1, we see how to handle thieves. What if people do steal? How do we handle it? In verse one, it says, if a man steals an ox. Again, remember, this is talking about, uh, or, or this at least highlights the fact that God has no problem with private property. To steal something means someone else personally owns it and you're taking it from that person. So private property is a real protected thing in the Bible. Not only that, but God says, if it's yours, no one has a right to take it from you. Remember I say this is also called the book, the Bill of Rights, Israel's Bill of Rights. So if I have an ox or a sheep, I have the right to keep it as my own private property. No one has a right to steal it. It says, if a man steals an ox or a sheep, and slaughters it or sells it. So these animals are permanently gone. They're either killed for meat or they've been sold. They're gone. What's the penalty? He shall pay five oxen for the one ox and four sheep for the one sheep. So God makes sure at this point that the penalty for theft is high to be a deterrent. The point, the point is in all of this is you're better off working for a living, Israel. You're better off working for a living than trying to be a thief, not working and trying to steal your, uh, your food from someone else. The penalty is so high. If you can't work and afford to buy one ox, if you steal an ox, you're really going to be in bad, in bad shape because you'll never be able to buy four oxen or five oxen to pay this back. Better off working for a living. Verse 2, if the thief is caught, this is an interesting, this is a breaking and entering situation. Number one was simple thief takes your, your ox or your sheep, what's going to happen? Number two is breaking into your house. If the thief is caught while breaking in and is struck so that he dies, there will be no blood guiltiness on his account. So the thief breaks into your, well, I'll talk about that in a minute. Let's read verse 3. But if the sun has risen on him, so now it's daylight, there will be blood guiltiness on his account. The thief, it says uh, here, when it says he shall surely make restitution, we're talking about the thief again. If he's not killed, the thief shall surely make restitution. If he owns nothing, then he shall be sold for his theft. Um, again, just giving a, a, some color to the law, what were some of these laws like? And these are the ones I've chosen to go through. There are three things going on here for Israel not to do. Uh, or, or for Israel, not for us. Remember, again, I have to keep saying this because I, I, I'm teaching it as if um, almost in the present tense, like I'm Moses teaching this to Israel. You do this and you do this because that's the way the Bible's written. We have to understand as dispensationalists, these things are not for us, they're for Israel. We take our... Uh, we take our commands from the New Testament. But to Israel, there are three things going on here. Number one, if a thief breaks into your house at night, see verse three says, but if the sun has risen. So verse two is assuming that it's nighttime. And remember, uh, nighttime in the Old Testament days, there was no light switch. There was no alarm that was going to go off. It was very, very dangerous. Once the lights, the candles were blown out, the little oil lamps were blown out, it was dark and it took effort to get any light back in the house. So it was a very, very dangerous situation for someone to walk into your house at night. So three things. A thief breaks into your house at night and you kill him. God is saying in this regard, you are not responsible. The thief is responsible for his own death. He put you in such a dangerous situation that you have the right to kill him and you are not guilty of murder, uh, any kind of uh, a blood guiltiness, not on you. 
The second thing that's going on is the thief who breaks in during the day and you kill him. And in that regard, the law of Moses says that that would be excessive force. There's no reason to kill a thief. Remember, the penalty has to, uh, the penalty and the, the crime have to be equal here uh, in man's eye, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. So it would be excessive force. If a thief breaks into a Jew's house during this time and the Jew kills him during the day, that Jew that killed the thief would be responsible for the death of the thief. Very interesting how God... um, Well, I don't want to say that it may be misconstrued. The third thing that's going on here so we can move forward is the thief steals from you and is not killed. And that we see in the middle of chapter... or the middle of verse 3. He shall surely make restitution... If he's alive, if you didn't kill him, if he simply stole from you, if he's not killed, in that case, he has to pay you back. Plus, he owes you a fine. It says he shall surely make restitution. And then it says if he owns nothing, he shall be sold for his theft. Uh, Look at verse 4. If what he stole is actually found alive in his possession, whether it's an ox or a donkey or a sheep, He shall pay double. So the restitution, the fine, is that if you stole one ox, you owe me two. Remember, it's different than verse 1 because those ox were killed or sold. They're gone. But if I find my ox and I still have my ox, you owe me another one, you thief. But it also says, as we move on, if he owns nothing, that he shall be sold for his theft. If the thief doesn't have enough money or enough animals to pay this penalty... One extra ox, one extra sheep, one extra donkey, then that slave is to be sold. That man, that thief is to be sold as a slave to pay his debt. Remember, if God were a man, this is exactly exactly how he'd live. If this situation, if Jesus Christ were put in this situation, he would have done exactly what this law says. The New Testament says he followed the law precisely. He fulfilled every command of the law. In verse 5, we get into crop protection. Crops. We're talking about fields of crops, wheat, grain, etc. Crop protection and mostly protection for your neighbor's crop. Remember the command, love your neighbor as yourself. Here we have a love your neighbor as yourself type command. Verse 5, if a man lets a field or vineyard be grazed bare, So he lets his animals eat his ground, his vineyard, and his crops until there's nothing left. And then he lets his animal loose so that it grazes in another man's field or in his neighbor's field. He shall make restitution from the best of his own field and the best of his own of his own vineyard. So if you are careless enough to let your animals eat everything you've got down to the nub, and then make, let your animals across into your neighbor's field, steal from your neighbor, then punishment is going to be that that victim, your neighbor, is going to get the best of your crop. Not just equal amount, but he's going to take the finest of your crops and your grapes, not simply an equal amount. Again, God's system of deterrence. It's perfect and it's logical easier you better it's better off to be a a responsible farmer than it is to be a foolish farmer and let everything be gone and then go steal from your neighbor you're going to pay for that so the deterrence you're going to lose the best of your crops is a logical thing logical thing uh verse 16 let's jump down to verse 16 judgments about sexual seduction now this this is one of those things that um is really astounding that God has to say these things. But these things are all over the Scripture. Verse 16 says, If a man seduces a virgin who is not engaged and lies with her, sexual, has sexual intercourse with her, if a man seduces or talks her into, if a man seduces a young naive virgin into having sexual intercourse with him, an unengaged woman, then the penalty to that man is he must pay a dowry for her to be his wife. So if you take a virgin simply to have sexual intercourse with her, you've got to pay the bride price. And you think, well, what is this about? Why 
Why is this an issue? It's because what values a virgin is her virginity. What makes a woman valuable as a potential bride is her virginity. So the man who talked her into the sexual act while she's awaiting marriage and a, and a, a good future has stolen from her her most valuable possession, her virginity. So the penalty for such an act uh, is to pay the bride price. What would a man who was coming to another man asking for his daughter's hand in marriage, what would the man normally have to pay to get this virgin in marriage? The, the, the guy would have to pay that price. Now, verse 17 is interesting. You think, well, that doesn't sound quite fair. And verse 17 puts the ball in the father's court, the virgin's father. If the virgin's father absolutely refused to give her to him, refuses to give his virgin daughter who's been violated and, uh, and uh, deceived by this man, if he refuses to give her to him in marriage, the man is still going to have to pay money equal to the dowry for the virgin. So the father... The father gets to decide, is my, wife gonna, is my daughter now going to be this man's wife or, do, or, or is this man too much of a low life and I don't want her with him? Either way, he can refuse the marriage and the low life seducer has to still pay the price. Aren't these interesting laws? Uh, you read them and you think, man, Rick, hurry up. They're just so interesting to me. Uh, the things that God picked out to tell Israel to live by. Verse 18, these are things that require death. You shall not allow a sorceress to live. Now, why do you think that is? Sorceress is the, name, is the word kishef, kishef, K-I-S-H-E-P-F, kishef. A sorceress is a woman who uses magical spells or at least allegedly uses magical spells to harness evil forces or spirits, or evil spirits, in order to produce uh, bad effects, in order to bring evil to someone else. She's leading people into idolatry. She's a, she's a false worshiping woman, relying on false gods, seeking to do others harm, seeking to do evil to other people. The greatest sin that she's committed is her idolatry, and her active use of idolatry to lead others away from God, kill her. Verse 19, another thing that needs to be killed, and here's one you think, is this really in the Bible? Whoever lies with an animal shall surely be put to death. Again, lie uh, is a word that means to have sexual intercourse with. As crazy as it sounds, we're talking about bestiality in the Bible. Whoever lies with an animal shall surely be put to death. You think, why is that an issue? Look at the board here, Genesis chapter 2, verse 22 and 23, or 23 and 24, excuse me. This is when Eve, when the woman is created from the rib of the man, and the woman is presented by God to Adam, and this is Adam's response. Remember, he had all those animals. He had all the animals. He'd already looked at them, evaluated them, named them all. Uh, etc. He was given dominion over them. He was not given the right to lie with an animal. In Genesis 2.23, it says, the man, this is Adam, says this. Now when he sees the woman, when he sees the woman, when he sees her features, when he sees her height, her hair, her face, her eyes, her skin, he realizes, now this is one like I am. This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. So man and woman were created by God to be united in all ways. In all ways, there is no allowance for sexual deviation from one man and one woman uh, united in marriage. There is no allowance for any sexual deviation from a one-man, one-woman marriage relationship. You can't go seduce a virgin, and you can't lie with an animal. In verse 22, we shift here. Judgments protecting the vulnerable. 
Verse 22 says, you shall, not afflict, uh, you shall not afflict any widow or orphan. And this follows, this begins a long trail of God protecting widows and orphans in the Old Testament, even into the New Testament as we're about to see. God protects the, uh, the destitute. God protects those that can't protect themselves. You shall not afflict any widow or orphan. Verse 23, if you afflict him at all, if you in any way seek evil or cause evil to come on a widow or an orphan, if you afflict him at all, if he does cry out to me, I will surely hear his cry and my anger will be kindled and I will kill you with the sword. Notice he doesn't say you will be stoned by other men. I'll do it. A fierce protector of widows and orphans and the, the needy and the vulnerable. I'll kill you with a sword and your wives shall become widows and your children shall become fatherless. So God, we see here, I'm telling you, look at these things and look for the, the character of God that's pouring out through these commands. God has great compassion for people who are helpless. A widow has no support from her husband. Uh, um, an orphan has no support from his parents. These two in Old Testament times were completely destitute. They had no hope. They were simply at the mercy of the kindness of strangers or they fell victim to the evil of strangers. That was their only choice. They couldn't make a living for themselves, etc. So the penalty for mistreating widows and orphans is death from God. And that death of the offender who affected the widow or the orphan would then make his wife a widow and his children would be fatherless. Uh, I said we're going to look at this in the New Testament. Look at this verse, James chapter 1, verse 27. I said this widows and orphans is a theme that God carries out throughout the Bible. And, uh, and here's the proof of it. In, even into the New Testament, Pure and undefiled religion is this, it says. Uh, religion here, people hear religion and they have a definition for it. All it means here is the appropriate beliefs and appropriate practice in worship. This is a good, this is a good word here. Uh, it's, also, it's only four times in the Bible. In this form, it's only here. But in a slightly different form, it's four times in the Bible. Three of them are translated religion and one of them is translated worship. So we're, pro we're talking about appropriate beliefs and appropriate practice in worship. And what James is saying is pure and undefiled belief and practice in worship in the sight of God and our Father is this. And again, you see the widows and the orphans. To visit orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. To visit orphans and widows. So you think, okay... I'll see who the orphans are in the church. I'll see who the widows are that I know. I'll go visit them. I'll have tea. I'll have coffee with them. And I'll check that off my list. I have engaged in appropriate practice in worship of God. And that's not at all what this says. Uh, just quickly, the word for visit. The word visit here to visit the orphans and the widows. It would have been the same in the Old Testament. How Israel was supposed to treat the orphans and the widows. The word mean it can mean to visit, but it also means to look after. See, that's, that's more than just going to have coffee with someone. To look after someone, to check on them, to make an appearance to help them. So the visit is done with the intention of filling a need that might be discovered. It's not just a visit to check off the list. Hi, how you doing? It's a needs-based visit. What's going on with you? What do you need? What can I help you with? And it's a, a moving through with that, with that help for the widow. Uh, James's point in this section, in case you're wondering how did this come up, his point in this section is to be honest in our assessment of ourselves. If you go back one verse, he's talking about the fact, uh, just because you say you're religious, just because you think you're some sort of spiritual giant, uh, your actions aren't backing it up. Let me give you a couple of actions that would back up your claim to true, to being truly religious, 
to having the proper beliefs and practicing a proper way before God, you need to be looking after the orphans and the widows. You need to be seeking their well-being, finding out what they need, and acting on it. Helping, not just going to drink coffee with them. So that is what James is talking about here. True worship of God involves caring for those who can't easily care for themselves. Uh, be real is James's point. Be real in your assessment of yourself. So back to uh, Exodus 22 as we finish this chapter, verse, two, verse 26. If you ever take your neighbor's cloak as a pledge, love your neighbor as yourself. Remember, the second command is like the first. Love your neighbor as yourself. Get the care and compassion God has for someone. If you ever take your neighbor's cloak as a pledge. Now what this is talking about, your neighbor needs a little bit of something, uh, whatever it is, you're loaning your neighbor something and your neighbor gives you his cloak or his outer garment uh, as a pledge that I'll pay you back. Here's my down payment. Here's my coat. God says, give it back to him before nightfall. The man's going to be cold. Even our... The, the tenderness of God and even our simplest, most basic needs, uh, the character of God, the love of God for man that comes out in these commands is just astounding to me. If you ever take your neighbor's cloak as a pledge, you're re- you are to return it to him before the sun sets, for that is his only covering. It's his cloak for his body. What else shall he sleep in? And it shall come about that when he cries out to me and I hear him, I'll hear him for I am gracious. So we see the kindness and the compassion of God for a poor man who needs help from his neighbor, has nothing to give but the clothes on his back. And God says, I'm not, notice here in verse 26 and 27, God doesn't say, if he pays you back before sunset, give him his cloak back. No, he doesn't say anything about the repayment. Love your neighbor as yourself. You're not going to go to bed tonight cold without a cloak to cover yourself with. Give your neighbor his cloak back. Tender, tender concern. Exodus chapter 23, quickly we move to the ninth commandment. Some illustrations concerning the ninth commandment, which was you shall not bear false witness. What time is it? How am I doing? You shall not bear a false report, it says in verse 1. You shall not bear a false report. Do not join your hand with the wicked wicked man to be a malicious witness. You shall not follow the masses in doing evil, nor shall you testify in a dispute so as to turn aside a multitude in order to pervert justice, nor shall you be partial to a poor man in his dispute. Don't lie to injure someone else is the bottom line. Don't, let the, don't follow the masses. If the multitudes of people are lying about this person and you know better, don't join the mass. The masses are not always right. The, uh, what is it? The, um, um, if you have over 51%, if you have over 50%, it's the majority. The majority is not always right. Don't follow the majority in evil things. Don't lie to injure someone else. That's not loving your neighbor as yourself. You would, not that do, you would not want that done to you. You would not do that to yourself. So don't do it to anyone else. Verse 7 says, keep far. You keep yourself far from a false charge. And do not kill the innocent or the righteous, which is what your false charge is doing. You're allowing an innocent and a righteous person to pay a penalty that they don't owe because you've brought false charge. For I will not acquit the guilty. So there's a little bit of a, um, uh, a threat there on the end. If you do this, there will be penalty. He doesn't say what it is, but remember God is an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. If someone dies innocently because of your words, I would assume the, death is gonna, the penalty is going to be death. Verse 9 says, You shall not oppress a stranger. A foreigner is what this is. Someone that's not a Jew, someone that's not an Israelite who has come into your camp, don't oppress them since you yourselves know the feelings of a stranger for you also were strangers in the land of Egypt. Uh, To oppress here means to cause to suffer. To cause to suffer emotionally or physically. Don't 
cause the foreigners among you to suffer emotionally or physically. And you say, well, I thought God was only interested in Israel. And I say, wrong. God is a, is a, in a, a compassionate God to all of His creatures. All men and women were made in the image and likeness of God. So when a foreigner, a Gentile, comes into the, the camp of Israel, they were to treat that pe- those people with respect. It's as if God's making this statement, Israel, you hated being oppressed by the Egyptians. Don't make anyone else feel the way you did in Egypt. Remember that uh, Egyptian oppression that you were under. Remember your experience there and don't treat anyone else like that. That would not be treating your neighbor as yourself. And it also would not be loving God who made this, who created these, these people in His own image here. I want you to see as, as, we, uh, as we wind down very quickly here, God's focus on others. In the New Testament, we hear a lot about um, consider others' needs before your own, etc. We also hear a lot about, I'm trying, to, I'm trying to say that this isn't true. We also hear about the fact that, or not the fact, but the idea that the Old Testament God was somehow different from the New Testament loving God. This Old Testament God was an ogre. He was mean. He was vindictive. He, you know, all that blah, blah, blah. All false. When you see the Old Testament say, Be holy for I am holy. And you see Peter say, Be holy for I am holy. When you see the Old Testament say, I have compassion for the needy and the, uh, the widows and the orphans and the poor and the foreigners among you. And we see the same in the New Testament in James. To visit widows and orphans and to help them with their needs is pure and undefiled worship of God. When you see these things in parallel, you see, no, God's always been the same. He's always focused on other people. Now, I say that because the greatest thing in the book, this book, the greatest thing in this book was when God's focus Himself. See, He calls on us to focus on other people's needs. Love your neighbor, love God first, love your neighbor second. And we would all say, wait a minute, what about me? Why, why can't I love me second? God first, me second, and then my neighbor third. Why does the neighbor come in the middle? God, that's not fair. And I hear God saying, don't forget the cross. Don't forget the day when I put your needs before my own. Don't forget the day when I, in my plan, decided to send my son to earth, that he would die an innocent man for guilty men, for the needs of others, for the needs of others. So we can't look at God and say, God, this is unfair. You take care of yourself. God would say, it's entirely fair. I took care of your needs. It was at extreme cost that the Father sent the Son. We, we could never understand the level of that cost. We can't understand the level of the cost. We just can't with our minds. That God would come to earth, become a man to die for our sins. The needs of others first. It's all throughout the law. It's all throughout the New Testament. God says, you be unique, you be holy, you live set apart because I'm unique and holy and set apart. And he sends his son and as the ultimate example of holiness and holy living. Verse 10, further instruction about the Sabbath day, just quickly. You shall sow your land for six years and gather in its yield. But on the seventh year, you shall let it rest. Now, remember the Sabbath day was just six days. You work for six days, and then on the the seventh day, you rest. We call that day Saturday. Uh, So six days of rest, seventh day, or six days of work, seventh day is rest. And then the week starts over day one, and you're working again for six days. Now God is changing this. He's adding to the Sabbath day observance with the Sabbath year observance. 
So you shall sow your land for six years, so plant and harvest for six years. You gather in its yield, but on the seventh year you shall let the land rest and lie fallow. No crops would go in the ground on the seventh year, the Sabbath year, the sabbatical year. You may have heard that term, the sabbatical year. This is it. On the seventh year, you shall let the land rest and lie fallow so that the needy of your people, others first, the needs of others first, so that the needy of your people may eat and whatever they leave, the beast of the field may eat. Remember we see in Matthew, God cares for the sparrow, even a sparrow. They don't have barns to fill, etc. but not a single sparrow goes without food. God is in complete control and cares totally for all of us, even the beast of the field here. He says you're to do the same with your vineyard and your olive grove. So the simple point here is every seventh year the Jews were commanded to not plant a crop. Now in our farming, uh, whenever the fields are harvested, they go back and they disc it and they plow it under. But if you were to simply leave what's there, uh, take the wheat, take the heads off the grain, etc., some of that would grow back the next year. And God is saying that is what's for the people. He'll say later in the book that in the sixth year you're, you're to gather enough that God would make the, the harvest so plentiful in year number six that the people would have enough to eat in year number seven. It's just like the manna in the field. For six days you'll have enough manna, but on the sixth day I'm going to give you double so that on the seventh day, the Sabbath, you don't have to go out and find food. You've already got it because you picked up double on the sixth day. Same thing here. Huge harvest in the sixth year. Whatever did naturally come up from the ground, what God caused to grow, all of that is for the needy. Don't you go out there and pick that farmer. That's for the needy among Israel so that they can glean and for the animals. Uh, now the book of the covenant ends in verse 13. Just We're just going to read to the end. The book of the covenant ends, like I told you at the beginning of this, exactly how it started with a word against idolatry and rules for proper worship. In verse 13, now concerning, it's in conclusion, concerning everything which I have said to you. He's given, if you went back and you counted them all, there are 42 judgments that, that Moses has laid out, that God has laid out through Moses. Concerning everything which I've said to you, be on your guard. I'm not going to do this for you. I'm not going to cause you to uh, obey me. You be on your guard and do not mention the name of other gods, nor let them be heard from your mouth. Idolatry. The first thing, don't be idols. In verse 14 and 15, and 16 and 17, quickly he talks about proper worship. He says three times a year in verse 14, three times a year you shall celebrate a feast to me, a festival. There are more. There are seven festivals of Israel, but he's talking about three specifically here. If you want to know the festivals, uh, Leviticus chapter 23 outlines the festivals, seven holy convocations in Leviticus chapter 23, you can go there and read about those. But here he outlines three of them. He says, You shall observe the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Now, Unleavened Bread starts the day after Passover. The day after Passover. Passover is the day on which Jesus Christ was killed. 2,000 years later. You shall observe, this is the number one feast. He says, Three times a year celebrate a feast. Here's number one. The Feast of Unleavened Bread. For seven days you're to eat unleavened bread as I commanded you at the appointed time in the month Aviv. Remember Aviv and Nisan, the same day, the same month. This is the month of Passover. It's in the spring. For in it you came out of Egypt, the Passover, Exodus chapter 12. And none shall appear before me empty handed. So here God is talking about bring your animal sacrifices. You're not to come to me uh, just to come to me. You're to come with the substitutionary sacrifice of animals, the picture of the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, to come. So bring your animals. Verse 16, the second feast. Also you shall observe the feast of harvest of the first fruits. This feast is also called, for your notes, it's also called the Feast of Weeks, and it's also called Pentecost. 
50 days after Passover, the Feast of Weeks or the Feast of Pentecost, uh, the Greek word that Paul used in the New Testament. You shall observe the Feast of Harvest of the first fruits of your labors, from what you sow in the field. Also, here's feast number three, the feast of ingathering at the end of the year in the fall when you gather in the fruit of the labors from your field. Ingathering, harvest. This is also known as the feast of booths or the feast of tabernacles. In verse 17, the conclusion of this, three times a year all your males shall appear before the Lord God. Males. Uh, the wives and the children all, all often accompanied the males, but the, uh, it was for the males to go. And in verse 20 to the end, this is where we start to read and we finish. This is uh, self-explanatory, but God is offering personal protection for Israel. There is a great blessing for keeping the book of the covenant, the Ten Commandments, and all the other commandments that He will give them. He says, Behold, in verse 20, I'm going to send an angel before you to guard you. That angel is the pre-incarnate Jesus Christ. This is the angel of the Lord that we read about. I'm going to send an angel before you to guard you along the way and to bring you into the place which I have prepared. Listen to the care of this father. Be on your guard before the angel and obey his voice. Do not be rebellious toward him, for he will not pardon your transgression. Since my name is in him. I want you to remember when you think, well, who's this angel and how did he appear to them? Remember, for all the time that Israel was in the wilderness, there was a pillar of fire at night and a pillar of cloud by day. And we've already studied the fact that the angel of the Lord, the second person of the Godhead, God the Son, before he became Jesus Christ, he is the angel of the Lord. And he is going to personally protect Israel. Verse 22 says, But if you truly obey his voice and do all that I say, then I will be an enemy to your enemies and an adversary to your adversaries. I'll fight for you. For my angel will go before you and bring you into the land of the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Canaanites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, and I will completely destroy them. I will destroy them. Me, through my angel, will do the destruction. You just follow. The angel goes before. You follow and do what you're told. You shall not worship other gods, again idolatry, nor serve them, nor do according to their deeds, but you shall utterly overthrow them and break their sacred pillars in pieces. He's talking about the gods in the land of Canaan. He fully expected this people to go into the land of Canaan. They're only an 11 days journey from there right now. It took them 40 years because of disobedience. You shall serve the Lord your God. He will bless your bread and your water. You'll have all you need to eat, all you need to drink. I'll remove sickness from your midst. Interesting statement in the uh, days of COVID-19, this coronavirus. I'll remove sickness from your midst. So there was a great blessing for Israel, not the church, a great blessing for Israel for keeping His law. There shall be no one miscarrying or barren in your land. So all the women are getting pregnant as young women should and having babies. I'll fulfill the number of your days. So people are living long, healthy lives. I'll send my terror ahead of you and throw into confusion all the people among you who come and I'll make all your enemies turn their backs to you. Great blessing. Terror will go before Israel. People will get out of their way. Verse 28 said, I'll send hornets ahead of you so that they will drive out the Hivites, the Canaanites, and the Hittites before you. I'll not drive them out before you in a single year that the land may not become desolate and the beasts of the field become too numerous for you. I'll drive them out before you little by little until you become fruitful and take possession of the land. See, Israel didn't know that they had to do this little by little, but God did. He's got it all under control. He always has. He always will. And He tells them so that they don't panic. I'm not going to drive these people out all at once. It's going to be little by little because if I drive them out too quickly, uh, it won't be good. The land will become desolate because you don't know how to farm. You're a bunch of slaves. 
Uh, remember, 430 years in Egypt, they're brand new to living as an independent people, and the beast will become too, too numerous. So he's going to drive them out little by little. Verse 31 says, I'll fix your boundary from the Red Sea. So he's giving them the land, telling them what it's going to be. I'm going to fix your boundary from the Red Sea to the Sea of the Philistines, the Mediterranean, and from the wilderness, the south, to the river Euphrates up in the north. For I will deliver the inhabitants of the land into your hand, and you will drive them out before you. You shall make no covenant with them or with their gods. Again, idolatry. This is the third time in 10 verses he has mentioned, don't be idols, idol worshipers. You shall make no covenant with them or with their gods. They shall not live in your land because they will make you sin against me. For if you serve their gods, it will surely be a snare to you. And that's exactly when we read the rest of the book of the Old Testament exactly what happened to Israel. Exactly what God just warned them against is exactly where they fail. They intermarry with these Canaanite people and sure enough, they uh, get into idolatry. The idolatry becomes a snare to them. They walk away from their God. He has to punish them over and over and over. Oh, but the faithfulness of God. Thank God for His faithfulness to His people. Uh, a long time. Thank you for bearing with me. I went over six minutes. Let's close in prayer. Father, thank you for this town that you've given us to look into the book of the covenant. I pray that we've been able to glean from it uh, the things that are in there for us to glean. Uh, I pray that we would go back and, and read everything. We skip from verse to verse. We skip several verses of this law. I would pray that uh, the congregation and anyone listening would go back and read the fullness of Read the fullness of the text and look for you in the text. Look for your character to be laid out before us. We love you, Lord. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.